Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, I, um, I ran yesterday for the first time in more than five weeks as I've been dealing with some muscle issues, some weird ladder or, or pectoral thing that just eesh, I can't quite get rid of. Um, but I realized that not exercising is probably going to be really bad for me going forward and between the physical deterioration and potential depressive spiral, I should probably get back to it. With that said, I've been kind of terrified that the muscle thing would show up again the moment I started running and set me back even farther and lead to months off and everything else. And how do you get around that? But stupidly joining your running group and going five plus miles at a nine minute per mile average, which isn't super fast, but a lot faster than I've been going for the last 37 days. Um, the weird muscle issue was sort of there, but now it's been totally eclipsed by the fact that Every other muscle and joint of my body is flat out killing me today. Um, I I have not felt this rough physically in quite a while, so I guess that's a good strategy. Um, also, my lungs are completely shot, uh, as evidenced by a record high heart rate during that uh, that run. But again, I'll get better. I probably won't be joining them for this morning's run, but you know I'll start building back up to that and and becoming that guy again, or so I hope. Uh, the other thing that has gone on is that I, I went to a trade show last week for my day job. It was my first business travel since February 2020, and I wrote about it in the virtual memories email, but uh, in case you don't receive that, the conversations I had there were great, um, but I was masked up the entire time I was in Philadelphia. And I mean, every moment that I wasn't in my hotel room or outdoors. And because of my, my work and life, I have managed not to need a mask for more than a few minutes at any point during this whole situation. So this is new territory for me. It was a train station, train, taxi to the hotel, the hotel itself, uh, then back from my room into the hotel to the exhibit hall, seven hours there. Um, I was, I, I got why some people complain about masks. I'm perfectly fine with keeping it on, even though I have a little, little scab on the top of the bridge of my nose from it. But, but again, you know, Delta variant on top of everything else, I'm playing it better safe than sorry. Um, unfortunately, the company hosting the trade show decided not to carpet most of the exhibit hall, which I've only seen happen once before in my 25 year history of, of going to trade shows. Um, that did a number on my back when you walk around on raw concrete for seven or eight hours in dress shoes, which you haven't worn in a year and a half. Um, still, it was good to, to get out and see my work pals and just sort of have the the conversations you can't have over Zoom or a phone call, just the, the casual sitting down with somebody at the table at their booth and, you know, the things that occur to you in conversation that wouldn't have been there if you were having a focused, scheduled meeting on something. I don't think I'll be doing it again for a while, but but it was good. So uh, there's other minutia and, and anxieties in my life to bore you with, but instead, let's get to this week's show. So my, my guest this week is Professor Elizabeth Lash Quinn, author of the new book, Ars Vitae, The Fate of Inwardness and the Return of the Ancient Arts of Living from University of Notre Dame Press. The book is about how different philosophies from the Greeks and Romans, namely uh, Gnosticism, Stoicism, Epicureanism, Cynicism, and Platonism, and I got it in the order in which they, they are written about, um, how they continue to play out in the modern or postmodern world and, well, where it's all gone wrong um, and how we ended up with what Elizabeth characterizes as inward-facing outwardness 
as opposed to the more valuable outward facing inwardness. I know that sounds weird or catchphrasy, but if you start to extrapolate from that in terms of how we're incredibly self-centered and yet we're constantly broadcasting who we are, instead of looking more at the outside world and incorporating that into ourselves and a better understanding of, of, of who we are and how we live. Anyway, this sort of material and, and the anxiety of, of daily life, which is what we're railing against here, is right up my alley. So I really enjoyed how Elizabeth structured the book, how she defines and gives the history of, of each of those movements and how they play out nowadays. And she does take sides. I mean, she's she's showing us the shortcomings and or even the, the utter nihilism of some of these movements and coming out ultimately, spoiler alert, uh, in favor of a, a new Platonism, which, well, again, you'll, you'll have to read the book and listen to our conversation about it. Now, all of that said, Ars Vitae is not self-help in air quotes. If anything, the, <clears throat> the, the, the root cause of the book is a sense of dissatisfaction with, with uh, what Elizabeth calls therapeutic culture and how even though everyone's engaged in self-help or self-care of some kind, we're all really unhappy. Now, I'll note the book was written uh, pre-pandemic and we hint at it. I'd love to talk with Elizabeth more about what this whole situation has revealed about modern behavior, especially in America, and which ancient threads best capture the, the the conflicts that we're going through. I have this whole thing about Q being the new Gnosticism, but we don't go into that here. It was part of my list of questions, and I realized that would have taken us into hour three, so really. Um, but I think Ars Vitae is a fantastic guide to to ancient thought and modern ramifications. And Elizabeth writes it so well that I, I think you can follow it all without the classics background that, that I have, uh, which keep in mind is not something I've, I've pursued professionally. It was something I studied at the ages of 23 and 24. So it's not like it's, it's been a focused daily part of my life. If anything, it was great to dive back into that, that sort of world of, of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, but she manages to get across the philosophies and the, the history and, and the people and personages in ways that, that I found awfully accessible. I also appreciated the book's method of using pieces of pop culture at the beginning of each chapter to, to illustrate how those movements stick with us today and how they, they've seeped into, oh, into our art and into our entertainment. And as I mentioned on the show in past weeks, I took up reading Marcus Aurelius's Meditations uh, when my potential cancer diagnosis began especially in the worst case scenario when we didn't know where things were going to go. Um, and there are passages of that book and Aurelius's stoicism that, that did help calm me or give me some perspective on mortality um, and tell me that, yeah, you're not the only person to go through this. And a guy who was the emperor of Rome had the same, well, he had the same fate ultimately that we're all going to have. But there are other parts of the book that, you know, I sort of had to throw out as too extreme or, or, too far from my experience or just alien to the way I, I see things. So it was great to, to read Ars Vitae's chapter on Stoicism and how the that movement shows up in subsequent chapters and to realize that, you know, some of what I was rejecting, you know, they're core tenets of that movement. And she sort of shows how those are ultimately irreconcilable with a good life and helps us understand what a good life might look like. Yeah, I think about it, Ars Vitae, or at least this conversation about it, is sort of a companion to the episode uh, two weeks ago with, with Heather Cass White um, and her books promiscuously read. Um, you should go check out that one after this if you haven't listened to it yet. Anyway, I enjoyed Ars Vitae, which I mispronounced at the beginning of the episode because I'm dumb and I don't know Latin. Um, and I think it, it has a lot to say about how we could live, how we do live today and how we, how we could live better. So go check out Ars Vitae, which is A-R-S-V-A-T-V-I-T-A-E, uh, subtitle, The Fate of Inwardness and the Return of the Ancient Arts of Living from University of Notre Dame. 
Here's Elizabeth's bio from the book. It's brief. There's a more extensive one at the, the Syracuse website. Elizabeth Lash Quinn is professor of history at Syracuse University. She is the author of a number of essays and books, including Black Neighbors, winner of the Berkshire Prize, and Race Experts. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Elizabeth Lash Quinn. The basic, you know, opening and, and simple question I have is, um, what is virtue and, and can it be taught? I, I'm just kidding. Um, how about, you know, like wh where that. did the book begin for you? We can go no, to, you know, go later to, on. But, you know. Do you want to go to that question first? I'm fine <laughs> with it. <laughs> I think the, our conversation is going to evolve toward yeah. that question. But, yeah. but tell me about the book initially, where it began for you and, and sort of, well, it, we'll start with that. You know, where did Ars Vitae begin? And am I pronouncing it right? Uh, yeah, you can pronounce it that way. I say Vitae, but it it really is fine. However, I have added Greek. I have no Latin. So, you know, Oh, wonderful. yeah. Wow. And I don't wow. mean have, have, I mean, studied yeah. it 30 years ago, but my brother kept up with it and teaches it in a private school. And I just transliterate as best I can. So. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Mm, I'm envious. So tell me about the book. The easy question first, <laughs> <laughs> where did it all start? Mm. Well, I think this is sort of a culmination of my life, uh, many, many different interests going way back. And um, more recently, I suppose it represents my thoughts of about the last 15 years. I had um, thought of myself, no, I ne never did. Um, I always was very interdisciplinary with broad interests and uh, depth in a lot of sort of eclectic areas, but the, it all came together in this book for me um, and made sense out of all of my interests, I guess. But about 15 years ago, I had been a professor for something, I guess about 15 years. So it must have started earlier than that. I started to, I was a full professor, um, didn't need to do anything like this, but was just inquisitive, wondering about the big life questions, started to take a lot of courses. Uh, that you can do sometimes as a professor, um, philosophy, religion, um, and languages, and um, and then it started expanding my own areas of interest in things like well, returning to things like uh, more languages and art history and literature and just thought. Thought mm -hmm. and culture are all sort of one big thing um, to me. Ideas wherever ideas lead. Are of interest. So um, I was just really pursuing more studies on top of my full-time job. And then I had a Fulbright in Rome, Italy, and I realized that my enduring interest in antiquity and my interests in and concerns with aspects of modernity can really were related and they kind of converged. And that's when, so that was about nine years ago, uh, when I started envisioning that there could actually be uh, a project that encompassed all of my various interests. So um, a few li years later, the design for this book sort of crystallized in my mind. And then, you know, I was working on it and writing on it and having this incredible feeling of synthesis of many different interests and ideas and concerns. So it's really all about the continuation of the ancient schools of philosophy in modern life. And I saw those schools all over the place. Sometimes um, it was a conscious effort to bring something back like Stoicism than in the new Stoicism. And sometimes it was just unconscious and I was analyzing things I saw in this way through this kind of lens of, um, the question of, you know, when you see a movie, when you when you read a poem, when when you when someone does anything or shares anything with you, what is the underlying perspective? Um, where is it coming from? It's a kind of sensibility in a way, and the the sensibilities often match up, sort of map onto these 
this ancient conversation about how to live. So I don't know if that's a good answer, but. No, no, it is. It, I mean, it's, it's that question, you know, where the framework originated for you, that idea of, and no spoiler alert, the chapters uh, centering on Gnosticism, Stoicism, Cynicism, Platonism, and I'm, I knew I was going to forget one. What's the fifth one that I'm, I'm missing? I can't remember which, Epicureanism. which four you just said. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Epicureanism okay. is the other one. I always miss that one when I nice. try to describe it to people. So, good, um, good. which I should have the PDF open in front of me, but you know, no, I, I, no. I'll do this on the the fly. But yeah, that sense of mm. you know seeing those five schools of thought, you know, which have a greater and lesser degree of of I guess codification, transmission, mm -hmm. and and seeing how they're they're how they map onto the the day to day world is it's I found it fascinating. What I wonder was you know how much how much you had to learn not about those schools but about you know how to see our day to day world and and again what what became a revelation to you what how did you change i guess in the course of of researching and writing the book mm. Wow. That is such a good and deep question. <laughs> Sorry. We can go back I, to the virtue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's hard enough. I think that I did change drastically. Um, I guess, you know, keep in mind that for many, many years, all I've been thinking about is Ars Vitae, um, which is a labor of love. So I was, I literally fell in love with the project and every moment I had free to work on it was just, you know, I was in this state of kind of elevated um, uh, serenity, but this kind of intense drive to, to go forward and get these words out there. And I don't know, it's just this intricate uh, source of day-to-day -day elation um, that was, uh, I mean, I had enjoyed my other writing projects, but um, this one was was different. Um, so I'm trying to think. I've been thinking about Ars Vitae. I haven't really been thinking what happened to me, but um, I suppose that at some point, it, it might be when the design for the book became clear, which was probably about six years ago, um, that... That, that's probably when I realized that this was a particular lens through which I was looking at everything. And it can be that way. Um, you, can, you can often understand divisions among people by asking what their underlying reasons are. And I had been having that frame of mind for a very long time that you can often find sources of commonality or if not agreement, at least um, something that would allow people to stay in the same conversation. If you go below the claims people are making to the reasons for those claims, that's where we have a lot of common ground. So I, I had that for a long time, but this gave me kind of a layer below the reasons where we were, um, where we, have sensibilities and leanings that are often inchoate or unconscious, and sometimes they're very, very conscious. Um, and I found that these schools of thought, this conversation that these uh, incredible thinkers were having in antiquity was elaborate, it was intricate, it was deep, it touched on every aspect of the human experience. Um, and, you know, uh, I think it's worth recovering or not forgetting um, because they have so much to say to us and they would disagree vehemently, but it was part of the same conversation. And when they had a whole perspective, they would set up a separate school, often a school of thought, and people would come to study in that tradition with, with people um, of that ilk. And, um, but they would develop, you know, new ideas and it would evolve and, uh, but be part of this ongoing, uh, organic, intellectual, but also lived conversation. So 
uh, I, I started to think of that it, things that way, that what sensibility is someone coming into this conversation with, or why is someone giving those reasons going even deeper? Oh, you know, I think it's coming from a very stoic mindset or someone else, you know, I was talking with someone, you know, in somewhere in those years when I was writing the book, um, and uh, the person said, you know, what are you working on? I kind of explained. And um, he said, he surprised me. I thought I knew this guy. And he said, oh, I'm clear. I'm definitely an Epicurean. And I thought, wow, well, oh, okay. So <laughs> you, you, you really believe that the point of life is pleasure. And that's a, there's a whole philosophy built around that. You know, it's not that simple. They they don't just think it's not hedonism where we just throw everything out the door, any rules or morals, we just pursue anything. It's not that, but it is about pleasure. So, you know, <clears throat> why do you limit yourself in some ways? Partly so that you can continue to pursue pleasure. So I just didn't think of him that way. He seemed um, a little more um, stoic or something. But it was interesting that he had a sense of what he was. And, um, you know, that doesn't mean that someone's stated school of thought is necessarily, you know, what it is if we, you know, sure. get into it. Um, we can all. Because yeah, I, I thought you, you know. were going to take that into the guy calling himself an Epicurean because he's a foodie. <laughs> Yeah, you know that yeah. that that, that right. way that we've sort of bastardized or or had that semantic drift of what those words once meant versus what they've they've come to mean now. Yeah, I think that's probably where he was coming from, actually. Yeah. So that's good. So, I, I, you know, my my over question, I guess, is where did it all go wrong when we talk about the differences between antiquity and modernity? Um, but I also am interested in that that question too of how we decontextualize, bastardize, um, catchphraseify these these schools of thought into, you know, things that are easily digestible but are not thought out. Uh, we'll go with, where did it all go wrong? As long as we're going with the big questions, what's wrong with the modern self? <laughs> where did it go wrong? <laughs> yeah, considering that we both lived from uh, the 5th century BC to now, and then we have this clear idea of exactly when it went wrong. Um, well, I think, um, and I'm not going to pinpoint the exact, you know, historical <laughs> moment because, um, because I think that, you know, many people blame the Enlightenment, for instance, and I think there was a lot of thought that came out of that movement that did take us down a very bad path. But there was a lot of good stuff, and there was always a lot of resistance to those main developments. And I'm really interested in the way that you can pick up different threads at any point along the way, including our, at our own time, which is what I'm trying to do with this book. You can pick up other threads that could be resistant or to the dominant um, you know, culture or ethos or way of life and at any moment, because ideas are so powerful that if you can just keep one alive, there might be a moment for flourishing. So the, um, I think one of the, the worst developments um, that, we, that is really underlying everything around us, the way society is designed now, is um, the instrumentalization of, of things. That um, the idea that people are there for our own use, for our needs, for... <clears throat> for um, you know whatever ends we have. So if we have profit making as an end, that's our goal. Well, people are around us should be enlisted in that effort and anyone not allowing us to move forward with those profits should be out of the way. Or um, you know there might be something a little more humane like, well, we could um, help pick up a little of the slack here and there. Um, but in essence, they're, they're being um, treated as objects. So the objectification of human beings who by very definition are not objects, they're, they're beings, they're animals, they're alive. Um, the idea that they can be treated like objects is a terrifying thought, and it's behind a lot of modern movements that try to... Um, literally move 
human beings around um, as though they were objects and often as though they were objects in the way of other ends, whatever those ends may be. So, you know, those ends can be profit-making, they can be power, they can be kind of a purification, as in genocides, which often uh, have all of those factors melding. Uh, but that's the extreme form. It's also in everyday life, we see it all the time. When, say, maybe a relationship of some kind breaks up, whether it's a friendship or a love relationship or a family relationship or, you know, anything, um, or just a tiff that breaks out among strangers, it's often on the grounds that um, I need to pursue my own needs. Um, therefore, you need to be out of my life or you need to be pushed out of the way. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, there's a, <clears throat> they're bad forms of that and forms that look like they're not bad. Um, like they, they might look like, well, we're, um, this person's just pursuing self-esteem and self-fulfillment, self-development, self-expression, all good things maybe in themselves if they really come out in good pro-social versus antisocial ways, but they often come out in antisocial ways. So it's that kind of objectification of the human being, instrumentalization of other um, beings and, and other things too, and of the planet, of animals, um, that using everything for other ends um, rather than seeing them for what they are in themselves. Um, and then um, I... I'm very influenced by the work of the classical sociologist, uh, Philip Reeve, and other people too, who saw in the 20th century, particularly the rise of the therapeutic way of thinking, the therapeutic culture and society and mentality where um, the self is this pretty fragile seeming uh, being who that needs constantly to pursue his or her own ends um, and needs needs to let it all out um, in, in the 60s and 70s. That's the form that therapeutic really took. Um, and somehow by letting it all out, you know, unleashing urges, um, pursuing ends, um, uh, expressing oneself at all moments, even when thoughts aren't fully developed yet, um, that somehow magically, it was kind of a magical thinking, I, I suppose, <laughs> um, somehow magically everything was going to lead to the health and happiness of the individual person. So it's also a kind of hyper-individualistic notion of what the self needs. And um, maybe that's all well and good if people are happy and fulfilled, but around us we see signs even before worldwide pandemic. So that throws a whole different sure. uh, you know, light Which on we'll everything. also talk about, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that throws, throws, puts everything in a different light. But um, even before then, when I was finishing up this book, um, it was just, it's tragic to, to look around and to see how much, um, not just unhappiness, like, oh, this isn't the greatest day, but it's a pretty good, not like that. But really people um, having major problems even going from day to day and um, keeping their spirits up. Um, some t for some people, even having trouble continuing to live. Uh, it's a major crisis, and um, it's a crisis of meaning and, and community, um, of state of mind, you know. And uh, there's so many therapies of different kinds. I'm not trying to criticize at all counselors who offer real help to people in their time of need. It's really not uh, the, the therapists that I'm thinking about. It's the therapeutic culture. So even when you're not in an actual counseling session, the culture itself kind of runs itself like a counseling session, as though it were one. Um, so self-help is everywhere, um, even in you know genres and forms when where it, it hadn't traditionally been the main point. Um, but 
Uh, but now it's everywhere, but it's not helping in a, a big enough way to make it sort of able to justify itself. So for me, that criticism, you know, I, I was very influenced by the social criticism of modern uh, American culture, especially, but it applies to many other countries as well. Um, and so when we think, you know, um, is something terribly wrong? If so, what is it? I think that you can see it in this way of thinking that this has you know, instrumentalizing objectification, focus on fulfillment and uh, a kind of self-expression, but not necessarily self-expression of one's deepest, most excellent, you know, abilities and, um, and inner life. So I was trying to look for alternatives, I guess. Yeah, and I, th I think you have that that contrast between uh, inward facing outwardness and yes. outward facing inwardness. Yes. Um, in terms of of you know the symptom of who we are and and you know what we should be striving for to to well again you talk about excellence and that that you know it's it's not an accident that the new Platonism is the the final chapter yes. for the book. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I'd, I'd wondered throughout the book, you know, how much is directly transferable from, from ancient Greece and ancient Rome and how much needs to be tailored to, to the modern being and the modern self or soul. And I mean, I guess the question is, you know, how much has anything changed qualitatively about humanity? Or is this, you know, are the the symptoms we experience now, the things that were occurring twenty five hundred years ago, just not in the the we weren't all on Instagram back then, um, you know, <laughs> posting all of our our selfies from the agora. Mm. Well, I I really believe that it's a hundred percent transferable because mm -hmm. ideas are like that. There's an integrity to ideas, and we are still human beings. We, you know, we're not a different being now. Um, the probably, you know, 99% of academic scholars would answer that by saying, of course, so many things have changed. We have to think about the context of those ideas, and then we have to think about our modern context and every single thing that happened in between. And there, But what's frustrating about that way of thinking, it's wonderful. Of course, we should think about the different historical periods that ideas came out of, and, and maybe they only applied in that era, so some ideas might drop away. Um, but it ignores all of those ideas that might be of enduring importance and also enduring assistance and help. This is kind of our entire humanistic tradition. Um, you can, you know, Ars Vita is just like a drop in the bucket. There's so much else out there. And I think that uh, in many ways, even in, you know, the very best, so-called best universities and colleges, people are systematically being deprived of the cultural riches that actually are the, those are the things that help you deal with your day-to-day -day troubles because this is a whole record of the human experience. Many other people faced everything we can possibly imagine. You know, um, you know someone, someone dying in childbirth, um, plague, um, war, suicides, um, addictions, all kinds of things that we still struggle with. Um, people, really smart thinking people from all walks of life have been dealing with this. And that's the cultural resource. So, you know, instead of going and finding like the, the thinnest, weakest self-help program that might be like, you know, wiki how I actually love wiki how, so I shouldn't pick on that. <laughs> I think that's always a great place to start for anything. Um, and I can't believe people you know, actually, they're actually, no, that I, I'll, I'll say not wiki how, because they're, they're trying to think about problems like this and then yeah. put some help out there, but, um, but life hacks and, but, and things like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that, that kind of claim to have all of the answers, but 
really they're not going to help you. And um, the thing about these these um, traditions is they're very elaborate. So, and our lives are very elaborate. So everyone's own situation is is complicated in in ways that maybe that it's it's not happening to the people immediately around them. So it's very hard to find you know to to express one's own scenario and say, okay, but <laughs> but you're not understanding. I need to know what do I do considering that this and this and this and this, but that's why all this complexity is needed, the intricacy of these ways of thinking that they're they're at once simple enough to be guides and to help us understand sensibilities and where people are coming from. But at, um, at once, they are also full of uh, stories and, um, and systems of thinking, attempts to apply all of these ideas. And we have generation after generation who engaged with these ideas and then on up to our own. And I think there was a break in recent years, in the last 50 years, where people were getting away from uh, this kind of tradition. And um, so that's a long way to say um, so many people in in the study of literature or, or um, history would be focusing much more on what has changed. And I do understand that, that, that life changes and times change and countries change, different cultures exist. All of that, those differences are important to know about. And, you know, if that's what some people want to explore is just the differences, that's fantastic because it's all, um, it's all adding to our knowledge. But, um, but in terms of the ideas, they really can help. They, and they, even if they can't help, they're, they're fascinating and they're still, um, important and uh, with us very much they're very present even if we don't bring them into consciousness they're they're underlying pretty much everything we do because yeah, under was, everything oh. yeah oh sorry no i was going to say that and we were i think before we started recording talking about our our educational backgrounds yes. i went to hampshire college 1990 to 93 and mm -hmm. everything was deconstruction, you know, destroy every every basis of power, etc. Oh. The problem was when you had no shared foundation. Yes. Everybody just had their own thing. So then I went off to St. John's College for 2 years did the great books masters mm -hmm. program and got yeah. the foundation I should have had before, you know, starting Hampshire. Yes. Um, but there you get the the community even within a diverse student body, you know, you get we finally had a, a foundation. We had a, a common background uh, on which we yeah. could, you know, discuss everything and then have our disagreements about power and, mm -hmm. you know, what is meant in, in the various texts. But, yes. but yeah, it became a shortcut to just kind of dismantle everything. Yeah. And it's something I, I talk about on the show in the, the past. One of my favorite Orwell essays, uh, Inside the Whale, has a bit about the modernists in the uh, the guys who came after the modernists in the, the 30s the the communist writers basically mm. um they dismantled every belief system but mm -hmm. there was nothing left to replace it and mm. you yes. know it, they, they didn't get rid of the need to believe orwell writes and so you get mm. god as stalin hitler as the devil you know they're just mm -hmm. replacing the existing structures that that world war one and and elliot and joyce etc kind of blew to pieces so Yes. But that's Absolutely. me rambling on about my erudition. No, I love, <laughs> no, I love <laughs> I'm I'm just loving every minute of this. Um, I actually had a dream last night where I, I couldn't find inside the whale inside the collection of Orwell's essays that it's it's in. <laughs> and I really it's my subconscious it. telling me the world is going to end soon because yeah, yeah. the thing that I've used as my touchstone no longer exists <laughs> in the book it's supposed to be in. <laughs> it's such a good dream. Wow. Yeah, I I, it hit that. me a few hours later. I was writing I was writing my notes for for this this morning and i suddenly had the oh my god yeah i was trying to find the essay it's not even in the table of contents oh this was an awful awful dream because my mind is telling me i have no no anchor left so oh boy that really is calling out for film treatment that yeah. scene at Your least dream. having the letters fall off the page or something yeah so. yeah <laughs> Yeah, maybe but, yeah. a painting or a, a watercolor <laughs> would be good for that but yeah that that sense of and it's something I'll ask because you've been teaching for, for 30 years or so, mm -hmm. um, you know, how students have changed and how, 
your experience with academia has has evolved and you know again the 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 idea of what's changed and what's persisted for you over those those decades mm. which is getting away from the book but everything in your life feeds back to this book so i'm, I'm yes. sure it'll yeah. <laughs> yeah it does it does everything is so connected um it's hard to to give big characterizations of students because they're all different um so it's hard it's hard for me to want to to talk about trends in among the students um over 30 years i just you know remember particular ones and particular classes and things um uh, i suppose i've noticed a um a, a real kind of focus and Urge, sense of urgency in my students recently. There was a kind of a lull, um, I think, in uh, among, again, this is a gross generalization, many students in the uh, late 90s, maybe even early. You know, I started teaching in 1990, and I know for the first 15 years or so, there was a lot of talk um, about students being um, apathetic. The, uh, I didn't really share that because I wasn't wanting all of my students to be pol political activists. Um, mm -hmm. I was thinking we were just being in the ter teaching and learning. Um, and then there's other realms that people are engaged in. But that's what people said. Um, and uh, But I, I did notice with some classes that there wasn't a sense of urgency about their studies. And in recent years, in the last 10 years, especially, I guess, um, maybe 15, there does seem to be a sense, a growing sense of urgency as though ideas really matter. And I don't know if that's partly because after about um, 12 or 13 years of teaching the same courses over and over, I, just felt I was at an impasse where it wasn't interesting me to teach the same courses over and over. And um, the approaches that I had sort of learned in graduate school, not really learned in graduate school, but been kind of open to and liked in graduate study and in, in history um, had kind of played themselves out in, in my my own intellectual life. And so I sort of hinted to a colleague that I would love to teach other courses and not just keep the, you know, teaching the courses I was hired to teach over and over. And she said, why not? And so thank goodness she said that rather than, well, you have to. She, she was open-minded and uh, I was really surprised. I thought she would say, yeah, we, we hired you to do that. Those are important courses. We need those addressed. And I was very lucky because that's the case for many, many people in many teaching situations. But just, uh, and she wasn't the chair or anything, so maybe the chair would have said the opposite, <laughs> probably would have. But um, but she, um, you know, it was just a, a couple of people here and there, uh, several people here and there who would say something small like that in some offhand conversation on the fringes of things that helped me understand and come to where I came to and understand that um, you can break free of the things in your immediate environment and do what you're really supposed to be doing. And I, um, I took that as complete license to, <laughs> to teach courses that I wanted. And so ever since then, I've, um, uh, been teaching these kind of, um, you know, I kind of think of them as these little boutique type courses that where um, I, it's called special topics. It's a rubric I love because you can change the topic from course to course. So that has reflected my new studies and branching out into different things. And so um, the courses that I started to teach were things like the history of the self um, selfhood and the person and history of emotions. And then once I was deepening the ancient, uh, 
part of it, the ancient philosophy, and could really um, claim, you know, that I knew something about it. I would teach history of the self, ancient and modern, or um, emotion in the self, ancient and modern, various different renderings like that, which would allow me to incorporate ancient philosophy and modern cultural criticism or, or, um, or anything I wanted in between a painting, you know, a work of literature, a poem, a song. And it really started to speak to the students in a way I never imagined. And they made it into something I wasn't thinking it was. I thought we were going to study these different texts and, and such in much the same way I had um, been teaching the other courses, which were in things like American social and cultural history up to the Civil War and then since the Civil War, etc. cetera. Um, but they instead took it incredibly into themselves and started to treat it like this transformative experience. And it was just amazing. Uh, there was one set of students, and I was just coming to the end of the writing of my book, and it was the history of the self, and they just made it clear how important the material was that I was working with to them, and uh, in a way that I actually didn't quite realize. I didn't realize at all. It's not that I didn't quite realize. I had no idea that even one other human being would look at the same material that I was looking at and see the approach that I was taking and, and then, you know, find it really meaningful and a way to think about their own life and, and what they wanted to do and such. So um, I don't know that again, I don't think I'm really giving um, answers that might be that helpful. So well, the way <laughs> in terms of this, and it's, it's something that I, I wrestled with over the course of the book. Um, we're having a conversation, yeah. You know, true. it's true. it's you it's know, so does, people always think interview. I'm like, yeah, it's more of a conversation. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, yeah. it'll it'll divigate and go where it goes, and we'll you know we'll learn something over the course of this, or so I hope. You know, it doesn't have to be a a goal goal, but yeah. but along those lines, you know, tell me about the the nature of inwardness that you that you focus on and, and, and sort of the difference between that and, and the self-centeredness that characterizes the, the therapeutic culture, mm. I guess. How do you, how do you differentiate those? And even in your own life, how do you, you know, correct or check yourself in terms of, as, as I was saying, you know, when I was wrestling with the book, do I sit down and do this every week for the experience to, to notch things off or mm -hmm. is there something more important going on? And I've, I've concluded that it is more important than just having, you know, a list of names that I've, I've sat down and talked with, but I understand also to an outside observer, what things could look like. Um, yeah. and that I understand how my, we'll say soul, uh, has, has changed over the 10 years I've been doing this, yeah. um, because of what it means to, to talk to someone and to listen yeah. to someone. Oh, that's so amazing to hear about your own uh, sense of things. Um, I mean, we'll yeah. sell books too, but you know, still it's, it's about true. the human connection. <laughs> true. True. <laughs> um, well, uh, so inwardness versus self-centeredness, I guess, if we wanted to, to, you know, to, to actually form some sort of question in the middle of my rambling. Yeah, thing. that's a great question. And, and I got the question. Um, I was just thinking too, of the, um, the idea of what you said, uh, I, I'm aware of what it could look like from the outside. And I think that it's actually something people recognize. Maybe they don't always know to look for it, but if they are looking or observing, they do recognize when someone is doing something for a way that could fit, you know, the demands of uh, making a living and that kind of thing. So it's not that it's not um, helping to make money or something like that, but um, or it it could it could you know build someone up in terms of their reputation or their their glory their uh, their uh, reception of a certain honor and things like that their position um, 
But I think people recognize when people are also doing it for those other reasons that you're you're suggesting. Um, I guess in to share in my from my own mind, I'm trying to think of a vocabulary for that um, to make it simple. And it would be um, in, in in shorthand in my own mind, it's pretty much are people doing it for real reasons or you know other reasons? And I guess you could say worldly reasons, which can be perfectly valid, or um, or reasons of the soul or the spirit. Um, and the worldly, the pursuit of worldly activities can, if it's not completely separate from those other uh, pursuits, those deeper pursuits, it can be transformative of the world. I mean, it can, it can even if it's only one, it, it transforms one other person's experience of being alive for one moment. If it makes that better, then that is work well done. Um, so I think that people recognize, in other words, that you, you said it, it looks from the outside, it could look from the outside that it's, you know, for, for um, you know, building up career. And or just like some sort of glory aspect yeah, as opposed yeah. to, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which we all um, are capable of, you know, we, we have as, as motivation sometimes as well. Not all bad. Um, but so inwardness, um, so one thing Philip Reef says about inwardness is just intriguing to me, and that is that, and, and other, other people, particularly theologians, have um, worked with this idea that we are inherently um, in this state as human beings of inwardness, and it can be terrifying, lonely, divisive, because we are this you know, this individual self, this, this one being in the one body, etc. Um, and then there's another kind of inwardness that is, um, I wouldn't really even call it that, but it's kind of what passes for inwardness today in our main dominant culture. And that is that kind of self-centered, self-focused, um, self-gazing, um, seemingly inward looking um, self that um, stops at the point of what the self, what's good for the self alone. It, it could have other dimensions, not just profit making and power and glory and reputation and career and CV and all that stuff. It might have a deeper element, but only for the self's own good. So it continues that instrumentalization and objectification of the human being and, you know, thinking about the self alone at all costs and not other people. So it's an antisocial form of, of sort of self conception, you know, how people think of the self. So then I think that there's this other inwardness as Reef also thinks and, um, and many others in various you know, world religious traditions, that um, you can transform the inwardness that we inherit by virtue of being born and being isolated individuals that, that can turn into this terrible, debilitating loneliness that, that um, can, can make life miserable. You can transform that into this other kind of inwardness, and that's what my book is, is trying to point to, that um, that I think that these these schools of philosophical thought, the conversation itself, the bigger conversation, which says, you know, how should we live, um, that can point us to this other kind of inwardness, and um, one way to think of it is the cultivation of the inner life. So it's a um, it's a way of looking at the self as though what goes on within the the, the, the inner, inner you know, sanctum of the self that it can be instead of this lonely, you know, uh, isolating chamber with echoes where all the people that you wanted to be there are not, you know, the, the loneliness, the radical kind of alienation from the world that we're all, you know, we can all feel at times that can be transformed into this like rich inner garden that you cultivate 
um, each book that you read or even just each sentence that you read or you hear someone say that meant something to you, if you take that inside yourself and contemplate that um, or, or just, you know, look at a tree or a bird or your pet or your loved one or anything, like just take a look at your own eye in the mirror. It's, a, it's like a whole world of beauty in there um, or someone else's eye. Uh, the eyes are just like these gems. There's all everywhere we look are things that are free to us they they and they don't take a lot to to come to they are they are there whatever is there that presents itself can be an uh an object uh, or not really an object a a uh, figment of of this world um and by doing that um I think in that inner world, in that inner life, is where you re you come up with the forces that you have to answer to. If you have a God, if you you know have a conscience, if you have any sense of morals, or if you just have a desire for some kind of goodness, um, that's who you have to reckon with. It's it's right in there. So you know. If, if we don't spend our lives taking the things that we're living through and seeing all around us and bring it into ourselves and really grapple with it, we have trouble reckoning with our own kind of moral um, conscience or the voice uh, within us that, that has a striving to, to make things good and to, to make us try to, to be good to some degree. So that's kind of where um, where we need to to bring things and, and spend time and to sit with. And there's a way of doing that that brings us out of ourselves again. It because it it transforms itself into this rich resource, a safe place where you can always go and you draw all this strength from. And it's where, you know, you you might not have any friends that seem to understand you in this world, at least right at the moment. Um, and But the thing is, all these other people lived already, and many of them wrote things, and they left them, and we can read them, and they can be your companions. Um, and they're, they're ones that are very vocal, you know, they have a lot to say, and they answer all kinds of big questions. They address these things. And so, um, so that that resource can be taken within and help answer a lot of questions and also just help you ask questions in a fruitful way. Uh, but yeah, it's my hope that people can realize that this is a free resource available to anyone wherever they are, and it can be the source of their um, feeling comfortable about living in this world. And it can be the place where people go to get the resources to be able to be strong enough to look outside them and have time and energy for other people and also the interest because once you realize how intricate um, human beings are you stop reading the surface of things for to be everything like you know there's so much sort of mind reading in everyday life where oh that person must hate me because, you know, yeah. the, the eyes, you know, there's no looking at me or something like that. There's all kinds of, uh, there's a whole inner world in that person. And if we uh, thought of our, our um, lives in that way, it's, it can be truly transformative, not just for ourselves, uh, but for ourselves, which is pretty much um, you know, vital but also for the world around us. And it, um, it's, it's a way of forging connections with other people to, to cultivate one's own inner life and then to realize that they too are in this state originally of radical separation and alienation and loneliness and um, yearning. And, um, but they have this rich inner life. And sometimes what's going on in their rich inner life is something they, they will share. And you might share. And it's a beautiful thing. It's been a weird 
this is something I've talked about on the show and you and I emailed about this before getting together. Um, when I, I disclosed my recent health issues, which involves a leukemia diagnosis, which is not life threatening, et cetera. Yeah. Um, every time people wrote back to me, I found myself asking how they were doing mm-hmm. not to deflect from my own situation, but mm-hmm. it was the sense of, you know, I, I, I want to know, I want to make sure they're okay. You know, mm-hmm. I want to feel not just what I'm, I'm experiencing in the roller coaster of, of the worst case scenario and everything else. But, mm-hmm. you know, somebody wrote me a couple of days ago about buying a book from the guest I had just recorded with uh, on his way to his cardiologist appointment. And I wrote him back and then 30 seconds after sending, hitting send, I was like, oh my God, I didn't ask how the cardiologist meeting went. And, you know, this is somebody I've never met in person who I just know through the fact that he listens to the show, but oh. it was just a sense of, of, yeah, I, I don't know what the, the community versus, um, um, again, radical self-centeredness or radical isolation from, from everybody. Yeah. 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 It's I, been weird. I, it's been a weird I, month and a half. Yeah. But. Well, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about that. That's, um, yeah. and I, I listened to, I don't know if it was your very last uh, recorded interview, um, but it was... Uh, the screenwriter who has had cancer for the last 20 years. Yes. Yeah, that was, that was, that, that's the one that will be airing, or that aired one week before yours goes out. Oh, so yeah. That's yeah, a, that was a wonderful interview. It spoke yeah, it was to interesting. me. It spoke yeah. to me too, because I just lost my brother. And yeah. Um, yeah, so these kinds of things are very much on my mind. Um, I mean, getting past the virtue question, it's that yeah. that bigger question: Does philosophy prepare us for death? Yeah. And is it is it meant to? I think so. I think yeah. so. I think that uh, one of the you know life changing and sometimes life life shattering um, uh, recognitions is when we discover death. And we, we understand that not just the, you know, the ant that we see die or something, not just that being dies, but then human beings do too. It puts everything in this state of precarity. Um, when, we, when we have people to love, we can lose ourselves in that, the wonder of that and the good feelings of all kinds. But it, at the very same time, it creates this horrible situation where you understand because you know of the existence of death you know you might lose this person um parents brothers sisters loved one lovers you know spouses um children it just goes on and on the list goes on and on and on um you you know death exists it's real and so anyone who's thinking hard about life immediately encounters the question of death and it's really amazing that we even you know uh, Get up in the what morning. is it what is that bob <laughs> dylan line that uh we can even he feed not- ourselves uh, oh yeah <laughs> i forget that, that line but um it is it's a wonder but that's that's also a source of tremendous you know uh elation and meaning and and glory that how does anyone get up once you discover the reality of death? It pretty much puts a you know a sour tinge on everything, sour taste on everything. But um, but no, so people are still getting up. People have done really amazing things, even with this short life of ours. And these philosophers address it head on. Um, Epicureanism is very much you know all about um, an awareness of how the fear of death, if you live your whole life just fearing death at every moment, you will deprive yourself of your life. They don't say, you know, abandon all thought of that. In fact, they they want us to pursue pleasure, the Epicureans, because of life being short. And, and for them, they really think, you know, it ends at a certain point. And that's it. So, um, so it's very important to for to them to think of the those day to day pleasures and and live moderately so that you can 
uh, continue to enjoy those day-to-day -day pleasures like you know, friendship and eating and um, drinking and uh, you know enjoying the gardens and all of those kinds of things that they like. Um, and the Stoics are, you know, always have death in mind. What what kind of death should we have? What 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 might happen to us? We none of us know exactly how we might die or what the exact circumstances are. So we're preparing ourselves for the uh, inevitability of death that we all face. And so for for Stoics, they were. They were often, you know, meditating on that, on, on death and um, and what would that mean about their own character. They were trying to cultivate virtue and, you know, self-control and, and um, pursue honorable things. Would they lose all of that when they were dying? Would that, would that counteract the whole sense that they had developed a, a strong character? So... The way that one dies was something that they talked about a lot. Um, so, I, yeah. You know, to be yeah. arch, I brought my, my copy of Marcus Aurelius with me to the oncologist <laughs> clinic last time and realized no one's going to get this joke. I, I should probably just put that book down and, and, and hide it. You should. You wouldn't believe that book is just selling like hotcakes. It's, there's a new, um, a new, uh, translation. Well, there's there are many new translations out. They're coming out. They're selling. Um, people are you know talking about it and reading it. So if you took it, you know, if you take it in on a regular basis, yeah. people well, will I'm, probably I'm, start talking about. I'm very lucky book. that I was told a uh, regular basis is every six months. So oh, I, I don't have. Yes, yeah. yes. I, I I knew that from the other end. Yeah, but that's so, a a okay. you know, and that, that's yes. also part of the you know. Do you look at each other, or just look down at your book while you're uh, you're, you're in that waiting room? Mm. But yeah, that yeah, that yeah. that sense. Well, I guess the question beyond does philosophy prepare us for death is that the the telos of philosophy, or just a, not a side effect, but a you know an added benefit, or does philosophy ultimately exist to help us try to reckon with the fact that we'll die? Mm. or only the good philosophies i don't know <laughs> yeah only the enduring ones maybe because yeah. we all have to contend with that um, except the gnostics who will uh transcend yeah. and skip out on the universe so. yes that's right that's <laughs> exactly right um yeah i that's that's such a good question about philosophy that i would have to think more about i guess i wouldn't want to say that's the. Did you say the main thing? The main. Yeah. Import? Is it the the yeah. the the reason for being for yeah. philosophy? It could be, um, it could be indeed, but I'll I'll have to think about that. Um, but we'll have to have a follow up I, podcast about this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would love to. Um, but I do think that it um, it it surely this this way of approaching philosophy, where it's connected to life and and our, the burning questions that we all face. Um, in our own lives, day to day and long term, um, this way of approaching philosophy is um, uh, is also about how to live given that we die. So it's not all you know. I don't. I think the especially when we get to Platonism, I think that that um, that gives a very different answer to these questions in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, which is partly why I find it so compelling that um, it's a it's an approach that fits with that notion of inwardness that I was talking about before. Yeah, let's. It's a it's an over question I have for you. I, I know philosophy begins with wonder, of course, but where it began for you and whether your own life sort of progressed in thought, mirroring the. The different schools that you you characterize in Narsvitai, you know, were you a Platonist from the beginning? Did you grow into it? And where did philosophy start in your life? Mm -hmm. Again, just the little questions, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's better. Maybe if I had given more serious thought to 
my own autobiography, but you know, <laughs> that might come someday. Um, but uh, hmm. I think I was a born Platonist. I think yeah. I have the others, um, the other schools of thought, um, except for not, <laughs> I have no affinity for the Gnostic at all, but, um, but definitely the Stoic. And I, I have precious little uh, for Cynic either. But, you know, that's, that's why this book is here. If anyone wants to find out more about that, what would the reasons be for, you know, the yeah. preference for some of these schools over the others. But certainly the Stoic um, school of thought ha has been important to me. Um, I think that I rediscovered Platonism um, that was that was pretty deep within me all along, but I'd gotten you know away from it and away from philosophy um, as I was pursuing being a, a modernist, a professor of modern American cultural, social, intellectual history. Um, I enjoyed a lot of that. I enjoyed the material. I enjoyed the social critics that I was studying, but it was um, very limited for me. As, as I said in, in my courses, I kind of felt I came up against an impasse, and I think that was part of a larger sense of facing an intellectual dead end, that the kinds of approaches of uh, most of the people around me, the way they were pursuing their study of things, uh, was highly competent, no doubt about that. You know, they all deserve their positions and things are very, very you know, great scholars. But I felt as though they were never really getting to the big questions. And to me, it was always those big questions that was at the heart of, you know, why would we even gather in a seminar <clears throat> if we weren't going to if we weren't going to get somewhere in talking, you know, like if we weren't going to have a conversation like this one, for instance, where we talk about real things um, of shared concern and we might venture some provisional answers or just get to better questions, but certainly converse about things that matter to human beings living upon this earth. Instead, yeah. it was like this whole different activity and I would go along with it because I was so starved intellectually. So I would go to seminars and all kinds of things that had nothing to do with my own interests. And I would go along with their rituals and their customs and understand that you can't just, you know, cut through everything and say, okay, but why, why would this, you know, be important at all? What, what bigger question does this even address? And why are you not taking a risk in addressing it? You know, no, I was polite. Um, I would try to push things in a meaningful way if I did, you know, venture um, some kind of uh, comment or question. But ultimately, I just was absolutely, you know, feeling like I was in a, a barren, in a desert. And, and I finally kind of faced that, I guess, as I went along pursuing the studies that I was really interested in and the questions I really wanted to address. And um, one of the first things I did was I saw that there was a seminar listed in the philosophy department, simply called love. And I thought, okay, I'm a professor. Sure. I don't see anyone around me taking any classes. No one was doing that, particularly in the school uh, that the history department is in. Not a thing, you know, but I thought, okay, it's a cold winter evening heart of a Syracuse you know we're practically yeah, up by Canada I, I've been here. up there in winter time I, I, <laughs> I used to have a girlfriend it's who's cold. from there yeah I, that was one of the reasons we split was just <laughs> I, I can't bear being around your family under the best circumstances much less the middle of winter so <laughs> yeah exactly it makes things challenging and so I, you know, I, I went to, to campus on this, it was blizzardy, it was cold, it was dark and everything. And I just completely loved every minute from then on, because I think I realized if there's a seminar called love, there's anything there. The world is different from what I thought. There's more possibility in it. And when I uh, was taking that, you know, auditing that course, 
I just felt tremendous gratitude, you know, to begin with that who would let you just sit in on a course and do these readings. And I mean, it's unbelievable that, you know, the whole phenomenon of being able to study things is it's unbelievable that exists. And when you're studying things that mean something to you, it's a tremendous source of gratitude. You just feel lucky to be able to do it, to be part of it, to know, to learn what has been written that you could read. And so we read Plato and that my life has been different ever since. I, I must've read a little Plato earlier in life, but this was different. Every single, you know, thought spoke to me and I, I couldn't believe that, anyone even you know someone living now or in the renaissance or any other time but then so long ago would speak to the very kinds of questions that i have and i'm sure many many other people do um so that was it and then i took another course where i was introduced to plotinus and then you know it's just it's all over <laughs> because you know it's i'm hopeless now because you, it's it's like once you once you encounter something like that that you read and it speaks to you so deeply and you're reading in an altered state of mind and and body and soul. I think you never go back because you realize that this is one of the most exciting things that's ever happened to you. It can happen at any time. All you have to do is pick up a book, um, or if you have no books around, you know, if there's technology, you can find books on there or ideas, or speak to another human being. They often have books in their head and might share a thought with you. And, uh, yeah, reading Plotinus was just... Uh, who, who I admit, beautiful. I haven't read, I have on my shelf, right uh, next to, to this. Uh, I'll send you a picture of my classic yes. shelf, which is oh, right next to my, my desk here. But it was a, a St. John's thing that um, we were very Athens-centric. And oh. when I went back... Oh. About 10 years ago, um, I was shooting the breeze. We had a, a four-day uh, seminar, went down uh, to, to Annapolis for, but I was sitting with one of my favorite tutors from back, ooh, instead of professors, uh, favorite tutors oh, from the, yeah. the 90s. I and like I mentioned to him, it is, it's great, isn't it? Yeah. Um, that, you know, I really, I hadn't read Virgil. I had none of the, the Roman Romans out there. And I, I really just had the Greeks. And he's like, well, that's because St. John's focuses on Athens. And he emailed me a, a, a reading list subsequently, which I have stocked my shelf with and have occasionally dipped into. Having to do the show 50 times a year um, kind of puts a crimp on on outside reading. But, yeah. um, you know, that said, something like your book that reopened me to a bunch of the, the things that I have read and the things I need to read was, was you know, again, for me, it makes the project worth it uh, to, to have those things open up to me and uh, to see somebody drawing those connections mm. of you know, from Plato to Plotinus and, you know, everything that, that stems um, among all the, the various other thinkers and the contemporary forms that stuff takes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I that's... also appreciate your, your mechanism of, of starting every chapter with a movie slash mm -hmm. pop culture thing before you get to the, the the heavy duty philosophy side of it so at least people are lured in um oh, <laughs> I thought that was a really <laughs> great model to, to use you know oh i'll get them talking about gladiator then they won't even realize it. boom you know we're, yeah. yeah now you're dealing with some really difficult philosophy by accident no i i i didn't even um i i really see those philosophies in those movies and, oh, yeah. and, and every other one i think we should go around saying, you know, is this a stoic movie? Every time we see something, is is that coming from a stoic point of view? Or, or is what I'm seeing here cynicism? Is that what, you know, the ancient yeah. form? It's just and That's also part of it. You need to, you do a great job of, again, getting away from that bastardization of those terms, you know, bringing us mm -hmm. back to what they first meant and, and how they still resonate. Okay. But it also raises the question that um, that really comes up in the, the throughout the final chapter, where we talk about that that sense of, um, of of the beautiful life and and of what we need to to really pursue is the use of the word moral, and and how morality is 
sort of a dirty word in some respects mm -hmm. and how much how much you have to wrestle with that you know whether there's terms that you know well moral is ultimately what what's required here this isn't something we can you know, make palatable through some you know again therapeutic term mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think that um some of the the contemporary thinkers from the 90s, um, especially in the communitarian um, you know, frame of mind, um, they were political philosophers who were trying to say that um, given that we have become so individualistic and so uh, devoted to our own self-interest and, <clears throat> and all of those things we were talking about before, given the instrumentalization of modern industrial um, capitalism and consumers and things like that, the way it can objectify people and and uh, loosen the bonds of community and tear people and families apart and things, what should we do? And they really um, advised a heightened sense of virtue and morality um, and uh, good character. So, and we saw it wasn't, you know, stemming only from them, but we also saw um, movements in schools for for character education and, and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, an education in the virtues, um, returning to some some sense of community and, and moral responsibility. So, uh, and then part of that, there, there was the communitarians and there was also the virtue ethics um, scholars and philosophers and teachers who were... Um, counseling uh, more attention to, to moral virtue and, and self-development in the sense of character building. So all of that's good. And, and it was a very powerful movement. We're still seeing the effects of that. Um, I think the new stoicism is, is you know, building on that tradition. And um, the virtue ethicists are some of the, the most important, I think, uh, philosophers now um, helping us uh, see what's wrong with some aspects of our current way of living and, and give guidance for how we could live better. But um, what was missing for me, and I think um, might be true of other people, some other people, is a kind of a, a motivating essence or reason for why. Of course, we all know we should be morally you know, well-behaved. It's better, you know, not to go to seed and just kind of pursue whatever we want to pursue and step on everyone else and maybe just give ourselves over to hedonistic pleasures at all times and all of that. We kind of probably, maybe some know, don't have that anymore, but there's a general sense that we should have some moral sense, some moral virtue, but it's kind of an onerous thing in modern life because there's also a lot of um, pressure even, but certainly permission to indulge in all sorts of things in, at all times, you know, and modern advertising really relies on the idea that people are going to be eager, eager to buy something, you know, so maybe indulge. So they've, they've often used indulgence as a way to self-indulgence. Like now the new thing is self-care that why, why should you go on this fancy cruise or vacation? Well, yeah. you need it for self-care. You're caring for yourself. That's morally good because you're caring for someone, right? You need to take care of yourself first before you can care for anyone else. So, so that's, um, you know, for me, though, why? Why should we be good? Why should we act morally? These are real philosophical questions that should be answered and asked, we, we need to ask those. Instead, there's, there's a common assumption that the end points are all so self-evident that we don't have to think about them and renew them and debate what our ends are and such. But I think we do. We have to ask those questions and we have to have some kind of resource that allows us to renew our commitment um, day by day and month by month and year by year and century by century as humans, as societies, as people, even as just our little mere individual self, we have to have something that makes us want to behave morally. Otherwise, 
it's just way too easy not to. Um, too tempting. There's temptations everywhere not to. There's urges. I mean, we are animals. We have all kinds of things that happen to us. Um, our bodies, our hormones, our our moods, our emotions. We might want to, you know, take action in some way and not think about it at all. Or we might even think about it and do it anyway, especially if we have no way to renew and and really take into our very being why we are acting morally or good. And to me, Platonism is the school of thought that offers that. And um, the other schools um, often are, I think, kind of writing on the capital from Platonism. They don't, they don't, they can go their own direction and things, but they're assuming the moral goodness that Platonism had at its very heart. And I think in Platonism, we can find a way to renew our sense of why on earth we would ever want to act virtuously or good or restrict our desires or, you know, think about someone else instead of ourselves. That's what's really missing from our times. That's the element that's, that's completely, I think, fallen away in the modern therapeutic consumer, consumer culture and the instrumentalization of profit making and, and power mongering. And so that the thing that can inspire all of that doesn't have to be just obligation and you know duty and things that are sometimes hard to take, particularly if you know if life is tough. Uh, maybe you have lost someone recently and you feel like, hey, forget it. I'm not going to act virtuously anymore. My contract with the world and my God is gone. You know, I'm going to just go for it. Or you you do get a diagnosis and you know, like my brother. He, he was told one year ago in the midst of a pandemic when no one could visit him, um, except for his immediate family, that, um, you know, you, you have stage four cancer. It came out of the blue. Nothing on any previous checkup showed it. You've got it. And now one year later, my dear beloved brother has died you know, at, in his mid-50s. And um, that can happen out of the blue. So why should any of us ever... You know, why do we have to obey these morals and why should we have self-control? Why should we have good character? You really, We really need a rich sense of that. And that's why I think the cultivation of the inner life is where we go on a daily basis to try to cultivate that. And to, it's really about remembering, you know, remembering why. You, you can take everything that happens to you inwardly you know and, and think about you know what what am i for what are what what is goodness it doesn't mean there are any set answers that we all agree with it means those are the human questions that we explore on an ongoing basis as new things happen to us and that's where we get the resource to to come out of ourselves and make decisions that are better uh, for us and other people for renewing the, the sense of goodness. So, so when we think of moral or moral goodness, I don't think of it as merely obligation, duty. Of course we should be moral. Of course we shouldn't you know, have affairs if we're married. Of course we shouldn't. Well, it's all well and good to say all those things, but deep down we need something bigger that makes us able to, to, you know, to stick to things that we might have known we should do. And I think of goodness as something totally different. And if you read Plotinus or, or Plato or St. Augustine, who loved Plato and Plotinus, and they, they also transformed his life um, and many other people's lives. Um, and of course, St. Augustine, his confessions <clears throat> have transformed many people's lives since then. And there are other writers like that um, who can change your life. Well, they... Um, they give this rhapsody, this, this rhapsodic way of looking at the world and just sitting in the moment. They describe what they see and what they're thinking. It's, this, this is uh, philosophy, but it's not philosophy like what a lot of modern philosophy is like, where you open it up and you might just think, whoa, that's, that's not for me. This is like almost like a combination of spiritual writing and nature writing and 
you know, science writing, writing about science, but in a poetic way. I mean, it's just writing like you've never encountered before. <laughs> People who synthesize everything at all times, they're trying to keep everything in in mind and then write down their little part of it. And so when I think of goodness, I think of like, you know, glorious music, <laughs> um, you know, and what, what music do you like? The opera, symphony, uh, um, it's, it's Bach, it's the divinity of these, um, these whole forms and genres and, and particular expressions within them. It's, it's the sun rising, you know, it's the moon out, it's the stars, it's, it's the feeling of a, a rose petal. It, it goes, it's infinite, and we are so lucky to have access to it um, with whatever is in front of us, we have the capacity inside ourselves to take it into ourselves and transform it into something glorious and beautiful and fine and good. And so goodness, it's kind of got a bad rap because it sounds like, oh yeah, goody two shoes, yeah. Uh, virtue. Yeah, of course, that person has never made a mistake. They're always doing the right thing. You know, they have a 4 average. They've never done anything mean to a friend or uh, a loved one or anything. They've done. No, it's not that. It's that we've all made mistakes. Human beings are fallible. Um, they're limited. We are, we are finite. We are not gods. We are human with flaws. Given that, given that we make mistakes, given that we all, you know, in, in uh, religious terms, sin, um, have erred, um, blundered, etc. Sometimes are hypocrites, sometimes go against what we believe. Given all that, given our limits, that there's this other thing that is a transcendent sense of goodness, I, I believe we can reach toward or uh, glean a sense of that can transform our day-to-day -day struggles in our lives and our difficulties and even our limitations into a pathway to, um, you know, a glorious feeling of unity, of, of beauty, of excellence, of kind of reaching the heights. And if you read uh, Plato's Symposium, his description of uh, climbing the ladder of love which is actually, um, he, he says that the whole notion is coming from a female philosopher, Diotima, that he, he says that, you know, we don't, we don't know if he's just uh, making up the story or if he really did, but in any case, he puts all this in the mouth of a female philosopher, the idea of this ladder of love that you climb to the top of, you can fall down all the time, but you can climb up again, you can take a step toward and at the top is this vision of, of beauty and unity and wonder where all things come together and it's goodness and it's excellence and it's love and it's beauty. And it kind of just transforms all of the daily kind of strivings and what we consider to be virtues and, and good ends to strive for. Um, it transforms them into something that's... Um, really impossible to put into words but once you realize it's a, a thing mm -hmm. you realize yeah. that all the great you know the some of the greatest composers of all time that's what they were talking about that's what they were their notes were saying that they were pointing to that the struggles the pain i mean all that is in a symphony it's in a shakespeare play it's you know it's in a john dunn poem um it's in all of these things that are free to us. They're part of our cultural inheritance, and it, and it's in us as well. You know, it's a it's a, a striving, a human striving. I think it's a striving for some kind of sense of transcendent good, and I think it's accessible to every human being. And it's um, it's it's really unkind not to to. Um, you know, proclaim that it does yeah. exist and that it's real. It, it seems unreal because it's, where is it? You know, yeah. if you can't put words to it, um, where where do you see this? If it's in the inner life, where is that? It, it seems immaterial. It seems this can't be a thing, and especially in our very material world.
Um, but it is, and it inspires a lot of what we see around us, you know, um, a lot of the best of what we see around us. And if it can inspire us as well, then we're, we're talking about reasons for why we want might want to live um, moral lives, but moral not meaning, oh, let's just stop at, you know, doing what we're supposed to do, behaving, etc. No, why would that be the limit? That's not going to help us renew our sense of why we want to do it. But let's always be in, uh, aspiring to that higher level, even for all the days that we don't get anywhere near then and we despair of it existing if we return to it um it's really a a kind of remembrance that which gets back to our our opening question what is virtue and can it be taught i think you've you've answered it oh good over the court i hope all right we'll go back and tell me no that that, i love it (laughs) (laughs) i think so i think so but let me ask just as a Oh, weird uh, closing question. Sure. You mentioned how much the book has has consumed you, uh, what it's meant to you over over the years. Is there a an empty nest vibe, having finished it and having seen it out in the world now? Um, no, I I look at it and I just marvel at it. I, I just can't believe that it exists. You know, yeah. um, I'm still in love with it i guess um and then i'm thinking you know what what to write next and i i just uh i have a lot of different ideas i'm still kind of living in the glow of of ours vitae and the ideas there and all of the the things i read the images that i analyzed um the way of thinking that uh it it showed me um and just, you know, I, I said at the very end of the book, if this even speaks to one other person, I really meant that because when I was working on this, it didn't seem like a typical, you know, work in, in the field at, at all that I was in. Um, certainly is not typical. Um, and it it felt like borderline madness and <laughs> Um, not always in that good way of, oh, maybe this is, you know, really creative, but in this way of maybe this actually is madness. And I would share these ideas. I, my mother's in her late eighties and we talk every day and I would share ideas with her, some of the more far-fetched ones. And eventually I read the whole manuscript to her. Um, she, she loved it and wanted me to keep reading it. So she's actually heard it three times spoken oh, um, and still loves it miraculously. That's uh, the do blessing. Do you do a funny voice for Philip Reef or anything? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. Do if she asks book. for yeah. another read through, maybe I should start doing that. Yeah, I would love to do the audio book. Um, but um, so uh, it, it, still, it still has that, that feeling. Of newness, yeah. I forgot what I, where I was going with that. Oh, uh, that it was... resonated with your mother uh, because oh. you were worried that it wasn't resonate. Or that oh, it yeah, was yeah, with one yeah. other, yeah, yeah, mad. Thank you. It was yeah. about the madness. See, I maybe I am <laughs> borderline, but um, because uh, she and she would even have that reaction that this is unbelievable. What you're doing here, or it's crazy, and so I didn't know if it would speak to anyone. I didn't know if it would have the coherence that I was seeing. Um, I thought it was, you know, as I wrote it all down, that it was coherent enough to be, you know, or I wouldn't have published it if I thought it was truly, you know, um, in in madness territory. But it did have this feeling that what if, you know, no one reads it and sees what I'm trying to say? That was scary. But I thought, you know, even if it's 20 years from now or 50 years from now, uh, or a hundred years from now, if there's one person who goes into a library, finds this book, reads part of it, and it says something to them, then I feel good, you know, that I that I went through all that it took to to do all this and write it all down. And then since um, since it came out, the 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 nature of the responses of individual people has just meant the world to me. Like oh, yeah. my mother, um, you know, first reader or hearer of it. But um, it's, 
it's just like nothing I had imagined, particularly in my lifetime when I had written this book. You know, as I said, I was really thinking maybe down the line, someone, it might make sense to someone. But um, the people who, uh, for whom it makes sense, um, really matter. It matters that it makes sense and it, it means a great deal. Um, because it, it is like communicating. It's, it's back to that original inwardness that we all have. Communicating one's deepest th thoughts and hardest work uh, with some, you know, non-existent uh, person out there in, in a very vast universe. It could happen, it might not happen, and that it does reach uh, each, each person it reaches just is, I don't know, it's, it makes, leaves me speechless. Um, with wonder at the universe that how can that be that something that was so intricate to put together and and kind of baffling sometimes as to why I was doing it this way and um, what what that would mean that that it would speak to someone and so that means that you know, it resonates and we resonate for one another in very mysterious and, and wondrous beautiful oh, ways. I'm immensely thankful the, the the book came across my path at just at just the moment that it did frankly um, oh. it, it was a wonderful book but it also as we were talking about my particular circumstances right now also it, it just you know it, it um, I'll say it took me on a journey in, in certain respect just in terms of helping me better understand some of what I've been thinking or how better to systematize some of the the intuitive or the emotional reactions I've been going through of late uh, and and what it means to again be alive in the world, which mm. you know I think you've you've done a masterful job of not just capturing what those schools of thought are but what it's like today and and what we're missing and what again what we can strive for without it being you know a self help you know therapeutic yeah. sort of thing, more yeah. getting at why we need to do what we do. So oh, I thank you uh, immensely yeah. for the book and for the the time because this has been, you know, it's even more illuminating to get to talk to you on on top of you know getting to read the book too. So. Oh, wonderful! Well, it's been my pleasure completely. And, and uh, I, I hope we get to record in person. But if we yeah. do, not in winter time up in Syracuse. <laughs> that's that's my only condition. You'll have to come down to New York, New Jersey. You know. Yeah, <laughs> I would absolutely come down there. Um, and also, you could come here at, in uh, this time or the fall when it's beautiful. I've but heard it's our, wonderful. Up yeah, there, right now, but, uh, oh, it's yeah. glorious. I'm looking out at flowers and our garden, um, you know, vegetables. No. I, on the other hand, beautiful. because of the relationship thing, only went up there around Christmas time and it was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just Not, horrifying. No, and there's so much that's awful about that scenario <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it seems, oh my gosh. We'll, we'll just downplay that side of it. But yeah, Elizabeth, yeah, thanks yeah. so much for coming on. This has really been a great conversation. I'm awfully glad I'm awfully glad you wrote the book. And like I say, that it, it showed up in my life at just this uh, appropriate moment. Well, thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. And um uh... Hello to your wonderful listeners. Um, it's been an honor to be able to talk with you. And that was Elizabeth Lash Quinn. Her new book is Ars Vitae, The Fate of Inwardness and the Return of the Ancient Arts of Living from University of Notre Dame Press. I hope we got across how illuminating it is and, and, and how much we need to look for a, a better way of living with ourselves and others. And you can find the book in Better Bookstores or through UND's website. I'll have a, a link to the book in the show notes for this one. Uh, Elizabeth does not have a social media presence, which may also be part of the looking for a better way of living with ourselves and others. Uh, she did say at one point, afterwards that she probably should get one. And I said, no, you probably shouldn't. Um, you'll be happier and less like the rest of us, I guess. Anyway, um, you can find my social media through the website and through the show notes for this one. 
They could support the virtual memory show by uh, telling other people about it. Let them know that there's this this podcast out there with a guy having conversations with really interesting and fascinating people. Uh, you can also support the show by writing to me or giving me a call at the Google Voice number for the show, which is 973 eight six nine nine six five nine. You can send me postcards, letters, emails, whatever. Tell me what you like. Tell me what you don't like about the show, um, about who you'd like to hear me record with, or what movie or T V show or book or comic or music or piece of art you think I should turn listeners on to. Um, I'm always looking for good ideas like that. And I'm looking for criticism of the show also. And especially I'm looking for suggestions for people I should be recording with. Now, if you've got money to spare, don't give it to me. Um, my expenses are pretty minimal. My day job takes care of me. Uh, but if you do have money to spare, I hope you'll give to, to individuals and institutions in need. You can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and other crowdfunding uh, means. And if you're looking for somewhere to start with institutions or foundations, you might try your local food bank or the, the Poor People's Campaign or Freedom Funds. Um, there are a lot of different nonprofits you can give to and services that will help us work towards building a better world. So I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, Talk it up on social media and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 